E is at the Spectrum Refarming again. This time building on last year's 35 megahertz paired 4G on 1800 megahertz work to now produce a whopping 40 megahertz paired on the band generating an astounding total 4G bandwidth in combination with the other carriers of 110 megahertz paired. Just absolutely astounding in terms of 4G bandwidth deployment. To understand how EE are carrying out this 1800 megahertz 4G expansion of bandwidth, we first need to look at and remind ourselves of what the 35 megahertz paired 4G layout looks like. Now on all these diagrams I am only going to be showing the downlinks to keep things simple. So in the 35 megahertz configuration we start off with 5 megahertz of GSM which is channel 645 to 669. Then there is the primary 20 megahertz 4G carrier which is EARFCN 1617. Then there is the 15 megahertz bandwidth second 4G carrier, EARFCN 1788, before we then get another 5 megahertz of GSM, which is channels 845 to 869. If we now swap over to the 40 megahertz 4G on 1800 megahertz diagram, you can see that some things have stayed the same and some things have changed quite importantly. So in order to deploy 40 megahertz of 4G when there's 45 megahertz of downlink, clearly we can only have 5 megahertz of GSM. And the channels that are kept are the first ones, so 645 to 669. These are then followed once again by our primary 4G carrier, which is EARFCN 1617. And then we have the widened second 4G carrier, which is now EARFCN 1815, because clearly it being widened upwards means that its center channel shifts upwards and therefore the EARFCN shifts upwards as well. Now, in order to do this, the upper GSM channels are removed. But this is clearly subject to the need for GSM capacity to be quite minimal, which is not the case in all areas. I was recently in London and I just had the phone's background surveying while I got up to what I needed to do. And you can see from this screenshot that we have GSM channels in the 600s, which are the primary GSM channel range, that doesn't matter either way. But you can see that we also have GSM channels which are in the 800s. And this was in central London, and clearly this area will have to wait a little bit before it can get the 40 megahertz L18, because those GSM channels are still in use and probably still needed in order to cope with the amount of 2G capacity demand in the area. It does make it quite easy though to determine whether your area is ready for the increased 4G bandwidth though. Set your phone to 2G and look at the GSM channels you get. If they're just like 650 and in that range then that's good. If there's channels still in use in the upper range you'll have to wait for them to get cleared before the, the refarm can then happen. If you have field testing software on your device which is capable of decoding level 3 signaling, an example being Network Signal Guru here, then checking out the SIB5 and specifically whether 1815 is there and if it's there that it's set up properly in terms of the Thresh Xs is also a useful indicator of how soon it is likely to arrive into your area. The augmented 4G bandwidth on 1800 MHz combined with the 70 MHz paired of 4G that EE have on other bands brings the operator's total 4G bandwidth deployment up to an absolutely unprecedented 
110 megahertz pad. Just breathtaking amount of spectrum. And the capabilities of this are immense as well. Plugging all of the numbers into the 4G speed calculator on the website with the configuration that EE has out in the wild, such as 4x4 MIMO across all of the high bands and 256 QAM downlink, gives us a cumulative sector throughput capability of over 2 gigabits per second on the downlink and more than 400 megabits per second on the uplink. Just absolutely incredible numbers. Now, while it must be noted that a single commercial user device cannot saturate all of these capabilities at once, having this amount of deployed capacity and capability is incredibly important for everyone. The large amount of capacity drives a positive average end user experience while also allowing very nice peak download and upload speeds to customers. In fact, the upload side is quite interesting in this context. Previously, the only way to attain 150 megabit per second upload capability was to aggregate 20 megahertz of uplink from 1800 MHz with 20 megahertz of uplink from 2600 MHz, these uplinks being the twin carriers to EARFCN 16, 17 and 3350. Now device support for that, uploading using carriers aggregated from different bands, is very limited even amongst modern devices. What is more commonly supported, however, is uplink aggregation where the carriers are on the same band. Now, before, this would only yield 35 megahertz of uplink, but now it can provide 40 megahertz of uplink because, of course, our 1800 megahertz carriers on the uplink are each 20 megahertz. This therefore improves the upload speed capability for devices that do not support uplink aggregation on different bands, but even for devices that support both inter and intra band uplink carry aggregation, benefits also exist due to the link budget differences between 1800 and 2600 megahertz. So whether you're an uploader, a downloader, or both, the 1800 megahertz 4G widening it's good for you and it's good for everyone. I found it quite interesting in a way how London is not the first to get the widened bandwidth. It makes a lot of sense why, because of the capacity demands in the area, specifically on 2G. But people always say that London gets new things first, so this is an example when that is not the case. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little look at the spectrum changes and I hope to see you on the next one.